Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Be The Church podcast, where we are engaging in conversations that will encourage you to live out your faith in everyday context so that you can be the church. I'm your producer, Isaiah. I'm one of your hosts, Kevin. And I'm your other host, David. And today, we are right back at you with another one in our series on answering skeptics. Uh, Before we hop into the question and uh, discussing it, Uh, I always like to say, if you have any further questions, if you'd like elaboration, uh, some of these can be very, very deep topics, so we love to hear from you guys, and we'd love to respond if you have further questions or just other ideas for the podcast in general, so feel free to reach out to us at podcast at aletheagainesville.com. We love to hear every single email. So... um, If you want more in-depth understanding of why we're going through this, I definitely want to refer you back to the first episode where we go over why we're doing this. But because we also care about you uh, hearing in the very moment at the start why we're going through, we'll give you a quick recap. So, David, why are we doing the Skeptics series? Yeah, I think primarily we, we believe that the Bible just calls us to be be willing to provide a you know defense and, and an answer to like questions that come from within and even from skeptics from without. And so what well, we think it's, it's worth doing just because it's, it's an act of obedience for us as Christians. Um, and so I would, I would say that our goal is really just to help the church body, really Aletheia church, think through many questions that are commonly asked to Christians or that people might be commonly asking um, to themselves. Um, and we want to help them kind of think through and process through, um, through those questions. Yeah. I think maybe just to add to that, you know, our desire for anyone listening is for them to be encouraged, equipped and empowered, um, wherever they are at spiritually, you know, whether they are a professing follower of Jesus, we think that it's appropriate, um, and right and completely fine to, to ask questions and to have doubts and to, to think through things um, on a deep deeper level and not just take everything that you're told at, at face value, but um, to, to challenge it. And so hopefully us going through these questions will encourage them personally and, and inwardly. And our, our other hope would be is that if you're a, not a Christian and you're listening to this, maybe a friend recommended to you, maybe the algorithm sent you here somehow, um, that, that this would be the start of a conversation because I, I don't think the three of us would consider ourselves to be um, experts in uh, the field of really anything that we've discussed. Sure. Um, but the, the goal of these podcasts is to kind of be a primer or an introduction mm-hmm. to uh, what we would call a, a reasonable defense or um, – an opportunity for us to display that there is evidence out there uh, that can answer some of these difficult questions. And so hopefully it will cur- encourage you um, to either ask you know, friends of yours that are Christians more questions, or maybe it'll lead you on your own journey to uh, discover and research and, and read more. Uh, and ultimately our prayer and our hope for you is that you would learn to know, trust and love Jesus as your savior and your king, and that in him you would have life abundantly. Yeah, no, I think you guys put it really well, uh, just with a lot of these questions are just so common, and a lot of people are going to be asking them both within and uh, outside of the church. Um, I'll just say my favorite line, we want to help believers think and, uh, sorry, to help believers think and help thinkers believe. Uh, just, and, and as Kevin said, you know, to start that process, cause this is definitely not a full dive in in every no. question as much as, you know, here's some stuff to start you and to help you think and, and to really start processing through that question. Um, so the question today then, uh, is twofold, uh, as we're talking about the general topic of hell, first of all, uh, really broadly answering the question, is there an afterlife? And then secondly, um, why 
does hell seem so harsh or just with a statement like is hell too harsh so we're going to break it down into two parts then first we're going to uh, talk about this idea of is there an afterlife yeah and so before we kind of answer that question um i i'm not gonna i know normally if you've been listening along with us like we normally try to like summarize or try to simplify the the question as much as as possible and and i think we'll do that with with the second question sure um why you know why does hell seem so harsh um but the first question is is pretty straightforward right is there an afterlife and i don't think anybody who watches this video or listens to this podcast will be shocked that three Christian people sitting around the table are going to answer that question with a resounding yes. Yeah. Wow. Right. Like I, I don't think that's that's, I don't think it's gonna shock anybody. And so what what I would like to do with my response or the way that I would respond to this question is give just a brief, just like generalization of what as a Christian I I think the afterlife entails, and then just some of the the reasons that I find it compelling um because it can be this is not a question that you can say well then then prove it to me right it's 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 not a question that can be answered that way um and so yeah the the first thing is just what do when i say as a christian yes i believe in the afterlife what generally um do i mean by that um and from from the bible we really see uh two two big um I guess you could say separations or categories, uh, maybe categories. Or yeah, yeah. Um, and one is the intermediate state, which is where what happens to someone after they they die and before like final judgment, right? Like we we believe that God will ultimately like judge everyone, and people will go to an eternal state, which is usually what people actually think of as heaven or hell or punishment um, and glory. What you know, a lot of different terms. Um, have been used to to reference it. So that is what, in at least in, in my Christian understanding, when I think of the afterlife, that is what I am referring to. Those both of those um, separate categories: the intermediate state and then the the eternal state. Um, but ultimately, one leads into the other, right? So so we do believe that there is an afterlife and that not just that there's an afterlife, but it is an eternal afterlife, which I think is also unique to right. point out. Cause someone could say, well, I think we're going to have another life where we live and we die. And then that, then the end comes. Yeah. Um, I think the, that would be the kind of like the simplest version of the, the Christian worldview of the afterlife. And when, when someone say, well, why is that compelling to you? Like, why do you think that that is the case? Um, probably the, the most convincing or the the argument that i would say is most appealing to to me is the one that basically like c.s lewis employs which is he he comes to the conclusion that he he finds these desires within himself that this world just can't satisfy and so he's like it's it's logical to me that i was made for another world or there has to be more than than just just this world that we live in, right? And so I think that's something that even before I had like strong Christian convictions, mm-hmm. that just made logical sense and it it appealed to me that this just could not simply um be it. And so So let me let me clarify there, David. In in that in that line of argumentation, basically what you're saying is is I can look out on the world and just say <sighs> Something's off here, and I find desires in me that I can't explain that long for something more and something better than than, than what I see this world offering me. Right. Okay. And, and I would even say, like, there's even in the good, there there seems to be, to me, glimpses of this is just pointing to, like, there must be something even even more like like even with like the relationships that we get to have with people and like how much love we can have for a family member or um just someone that we're very close to like the idea that that ultimately is is actually point like this is this is just a bit of that because it's so finite it it it's so fickle right like we can all 
die so quickly that it it, it just begs the question like th- it seems that there must be something something more that this is pointing to 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 something something better um and so kind of with that that mentality um i kind of classify like my my arguments as as a twofold um and um and and i don't think that that is the only like what i just said is the only reason why um although i i when i go to the bible it it also references for example in ecclesiastes 311 um it says that he has made everything beautiful in its time also he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out that he cannot find out what god has done from the beginning to the end and so when i come to scripture i kind of see what i am already kind of rationally or um, instinctively yearning for um, in a sense and and seeing that that is actually coming from God himself who has created us and has put this this realization of eternity um, within us um, so I would say like that's that's argument number one for me that's I would say is very um, ap- appealing um, one th- one thing I'd like to point out there just in that that verse in Ecclesiastes that you pointed out, um, it seems to me as if the author of Ecclesiastes is getting to something that uh, we as human beings really, really tend to struggle with. And what I mean by that, it, especially those of us in the West, but I, I really think it's the world at this point because most of us are, are a product of post-enlightenment thinking on, on some level, um, is this idea that God has placed this longing in us, but we can't know it all. Mm-hmm. And this is what Jesus meant by saying that he came to reveal the Father to us and, and reveal things to us. And there were questions that he would not even answer for his disciples while he was here. That there is this reality that Christians hold to and this tension that we hold that we feel like God has revealed much to us but there are many things that we do not know. And we tend to, right, at least for me personally, but many, many Christians that I know over the years, actually take great solace in that, in the fact that that reminds us of our finiteness and God's in, infiniteness, right? Am I, I think I'm saying that right. right? Like, he, like how he's so much farther beyond what we can comprehend and what we do know has been revealed to us by him, not as if we can know everything. And I, and I really think when we get down to the base level of many of these questions that we've been going through in the skeptic series, but especially one like this one where we're, we're talking about something very metaphysical, we're talking about something that is very, very difficult to scientifically uh, prove the existence of the afterlife or the existence of hell, uh, much less what that would look like. Um, it It's important, especially if you are listening and you are not a follower of Jesus, to know that the God of the Bible right, teaches his people that not only do you not know everything, but you will not know any, everything and you are incapable of knowing everything. And there's a great humility that comes with that. And I recognize that that can be really, really hard for some people to swallow. But I would also respond to that by saying that there's also great freedom in that. And that there can also be a great amount of understanding that, that comes from that as well. But it seems to me that the author of Ecclesiastes is saying here, hey, look, listen, when you are thinking about eternity and God placing that on our hearts, just know that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Man is incapable of doing that apart from God. And what we will know and what we do know, things that we'll even be talking about here today, are only known because of the revelation of God himself. Yeah, and when you were um, talking just there, it reminds me of, I think it's Augustine who who puts it very, very similar language um, where he says, you know, you have created us for yourself and for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. It's like yeah. there is this this longing that is within us is can can only ultimately be satisfied and responded uh, 
by God himself. Yeah. And so while it is a very, it, it's not, it's not an argument or a response that gives you all the answers and makes things very like neat and easy for you. Um, I do think it's, it's a very strong argument in the sense that I feel, I feel like a lot of people will hear that and say, yeah, absolutely. I've experienced that. I mean, even as a kid, I, I, I feel like I had this exact same mentality. Like this, this surely can't be it. Um, and so the, the second I would say, and this is obviously I consider it a pretty major argument is just the resurrection of Christ. So, and we've talked about this a lot in, in previous episodes, but if, if we actually believe that Jesus Christ was real, was a man who walked the earth, who actually truly died and came back from the dead, and, and we have good reasons to believe all of those things actually happened, then we should take his word for what he said about yeah. life yeah. and death. I mean, he, I mean, how many people do we know who actually died and come back from the dead, right? Not to mention his claim to be, you know, God. Um, but, but so with that in mind, then it would make sense that what he teaches in the New Testament regarding heaven and hell and eternity um, should carry weight and we should just believe him. Um, and so I know that to some people that might be, that might open up another point of discussion where they're like, I need to make sure that that's real, right? And so right. that that might be a discussion that with with a skeptic you then have to have before you get to this yeah. to this point. But I think as a Christian I have no problem um holding to that position um and believing in it because I think it's it's quite um quite well attested. For sure. So David, your your two arguments I think are coming more from like a scriptural perspective of just hey, what does the Bible say about the afterlife? How, how can it attest to itself? about the existence of the afterlife, which I think is super important. You know, there are Christians that will try to argue that this actually isn't a Christian doctrine. It isn't a Jewish doctrine, and it certainly is. The scriptures absolutely teach that. I think um, the the way I want to come at this question maybe is a little bit different. Um, obviously, um, this is a really, really difficult concept to prove, and I think we pointed this out earlier as we were talking. However, I do actually believe that there is some evidence um, – to the possibility of an afterlife outside of Christian theology and Christian teaching. But let me give you some things that I would consider to be examples of evidence for that. I mean, outside of Christianity and Judaism, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Mormons, uh, those, and those are just some of the major world religions, all teach of an afterlife on some level, meaning that you have multiple cultures, multiple groups of people uh, in multiple places around the world that for at least several thousand years of written human history— the human race has believed in the reality of an afterlife um, it, post the experience of this life here on earth. Um, older religions, so non-modern ones, that we'd probably was probably the best way to put it. If you look at ancient Egyptian religions, ancient Greek and Roman religions, and Norse mythology, all of them also have some sort of teaching on an afterlife. So for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, both in religions that we would probably now at this point call myths um, or in religions that still have modern day um, followers, uh, at least on a large scale, um, you have human beings across various cultures and religious teachings having held to the same sort of basic belief in an afterlife. Now, those various religions teach different things about the afterlife and and and. Certainly, that is that is a topic and a conversation worth having at some point, and, and maybe even a conversation worth having as to why we hold to the Christian version of that. Sure. However, simply just as, as as something to present as evidence, um, I think it would be almost kind of arrogant for us to discount thousands of years of human history and what human okay. beings thought. Um, they, they could be wrong, but I think it's pretty arrogant to just dismiss it full stop because in the last hundred years we've be we've become very very scientific and very very naturalist in our thinking. Um, another thing I would add to this is um, interesting and may even spark some debate, <laughs> maybe even more so from Christians than non Christians. But what I would consider to be eyewitness accounts or evidence to the idea of an afterlife, I know that these stories could be fabricated. But there is evidence of multiple people having near-death experiences or experiences approaching, approaching death or even what some people would call heaven tourism books where they believe they died and then they came back. Um, 
I, I'm going to reference for some of you guys, you can dig back into our archive to look on uh, uh, up an interview that we did a couple years ago with a, a friend of mine who is a hospice chaplain. His name yeah. is Artie Hart. He used to be a former pastor for uh, the Vineyard Church here in, in Gainesville. Um, and when, and Artie shares some interesting stories and testimonies in um, that podcast of um, – experiences he's had in talking with people that are on death's door and things they've experienced, seen, or things that their family has experienced and seen. Um, and I can speak from my own personal perspective. Um, I find Artie to be a uh, well-articulate, very, very intelligent man who's not going to just fabricate things for the fun of it. So what he what he's simply sharing is from his own personal experience as a hospice chaplain that – Really, his job is to help people transition from this life to the next, is how he would describe it. I would also say that in recent years, there is some potential for some scientific evidence that would attribute to the possibility of an afterlife. There was a study actually just released uh, last year, and I remember it came up on my Google timeline and like opening it up because I was like, this is fascinating. Uh, it was done by the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and they found that one in five people who survived CPR described lucid experiences of death that occurred while they were seemingly unconscious. These experiences included perception of separation from their body, observing events without pain or distress, and a period where they were able to meaningfully evaluate their entire life while they were going through this medical emergency. A key finding in the study also discovered spikes of brain activity for up to an hour during CPR. So one of the quotes that came from that study came from a, a, a doctor, um, both a, a medical doctor and he holds his PhD. His name is Sam Parnas. And he wrote that these lucid experiences cannot be considered a trick of a disordered or dying brain but rather a unique human experience that emerges on the brink of death. As the brain is shutting down, many of its natural braking systems are released, known as disinhibition. This provides access to the depths of a person's consciousness, including stored memories, thoughts from early childhood to death, and other aspects of reality. While no one knows the evolutionary purpose of this phenomenon, which I, I just want to pause there and show that I'm sharing this because clearly he's coming at this from a purely academic and medical perspective. I haven't just gone out there and found someone that might be able to come up with some experiment that would support something that I believe in. But he says this, while no one knows the evolutionary purposes purpose of this phenomenon, it clearly reveals intriguing questions about human consciousness, even at death, which I also appreciate him saying, Hey, there's something odd going on here and we can't, we can't really right. describe it. Yeah. Which lends to what we saw in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> right. But it seems to me that there is at least evidence both internally inside the scriptures to say that the God of the Bible teaches there is an afterlife. And here's kind right. of some things we can expect about it. And then there is evidence from other world religions. There is evidence from eyewitness accounts of people that are near death. And there's some scientific evidence of those people that are experiencing these near death experiences at this point. Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, something we've said in previous episodes that I think David particularly pointed out was the goal of these isn't necessarily to have 100% definitive evidence factual like this is the truth as much as to say there is compelling evidence, compelling reasons to really think about and want to process through these discussions so that, you know, we can say, don't just discount it, like Kevin said earlier, but genuinely like, hey, this is something to really think about and, and wrestle with so that we can logically and thoughtfully approach these questions. I, I think maybe to, to put what you're saying another way, Isaiah, something that I regularly did before I became a Christian was automatically dismiss some of what I would have considered to be the more yeah. mythical or fairy tale type things that Christians believe in. Um, and I, I find two problems with that. Um, one, I find it to just be intellectually arrogant 
and naive, um, which is exactly, by the way, what I was. Um, and I, I whole, wholeheartedly uh, admit to that and had really got humbled, obviously. Now I'm a pastor. <laughs> but I think, I think on top of that, I think um, not only is it arrogant to think that you kind of have all the answers and you can immediately dismiss um, someone else's side or story or uh, other evidence, you, you actually do yourself a disservice by, by not seeking out what the truth actually is. Right. It's like one of one of my absolute favorite moments in all of scripture is when Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate uh is the Roman governor. He really kind of hates his job because governing that particular area of the Roman Empire was extremely difficult. There was all sorts of insurrections and problems. And here come the Jewish leaders bringing this Jewish carpenter to them who's also being called the Messiah or the king who's there to overthrow Roman rule and he just doesn't want to deal with it and it's fairly clear that he doesn't want to deal with Jesus at the beginning of the questioning and he doesn't want to deal with the people that brought Jesus to him from the beginning of the questioning probably describing him as anti-semitic would probably be a fair uh, assessment of where he's at and as he's talking to Jesus Jesus is kind of going back and forth with him and Jesus doesn't really answer his question he just tries to engage him to get him to get rid of his prejudices and the, the, the arrogance that he's holding on to and to get him to pause and think. And there's this beautiful moment in their exchange back and forth where finally Pilate just goes, what is truth? And there's there's no like com- like revelatory moment for Pilate or where he gets everything and understands anything or trusts in Jesus or believes in Jesus, but he at least gets brought to the point where it's like, okay, like what even is truth? If we if we can even get you to a point where you're willing to ask that type of question, yeah, right, then I, then I will feel like we've done our job and our duty here. Yeah, and I really do, I really do think that's such a good place to get to because it can be so easy when finding when we, when we find these either oppositions or questions to be like, well, I just want like a one sentence or one minute soundbite that can just answer the question and make the other person see how dumb and foolish they are. But in reality, what we're finding is when we're trying to answer these questions, we're saying, hey, like everything that Kevin just listed out, which I think is a very valid and clear argument, you're like a rational human being clearly can can come to the conclusion that the afterlife is real. I mean, look at all these civilizations, look at all these religions, look at look at even the scientific research that is showing like something's going on here. We don't quite know what it is. We can't quite describe it. But it wouldn't be irrational for somebody else to hold this position. When when we can get the skeptic or the individual who disagrees with us to understand it, and we talked about this in episode one, we have to be the first ones yeah. to do that as well so that we're not just talking past each other. Mm-hmm. Now you can have true conversations, true discussions. Like I said, well, if my if my argument is, well, I believe the words of Jesus because he actually died and came back from, from the dead, then that might lead to the actual discussion of, well, why do you believe that? Well, let's look at historically why we, you know, it, it opens up the the questions behind the questions, which yeah. we always get to at the at the end of the episode. But yeah, I, I think that's just such a, a an important place to go when trying to answer these questions. Yeah. So as we continue with this question then, you know, first talking about the afterlife and then taking a step further to one side of the afterlife for uh, a few religions, um, a lot of people look at this idea of hell and just think, wow, this is harsh. So um, let's wrestle with that question then of why is hell so harsh? And and David, I know you're going to clarify for us a little bit on this question. Yeah, so... And, and it's not so much clarify as I wanted to at least list out how this question is oftentimes posed, right? I, I, it's not that people don't say, well, hell, hell is really harsh. Most, I, I, I hear this question asked oftentimes uh, by people in, the, in these two manners. You know, they, they'll ask, you know, why is someone being punished eternally when their sins are finite? They're finite people. Why is... They're like, fine, I'll give you, I'll concede hell. I'll concede punishment. I get that. I even punish my kids. But why is their punishment eternal when their sin is finite? Right. So that's one way that, that it's asked. Um, the other way is, you know, if God is so loving, like how does he send people to hell, right? So I think all 
both of those questions and even just asking like, why is hell so harsh are all really asking the same question. Yeah. But I, I wanted to at least give a few different ways to so someone's like, Oh, they're to, to give us kind of a, a broader scope of what we're responding to, if that makes sense. Um, and so just so I can interject here real quick, David is going to give what I would like, like probably likely consider like the, the, the basic kind of uh, historic Orthodox view yes. of hell for Christianity. But it is important to note that not all inside of Christendom have held fully to this exact view. Uh, and I'll, and I'll touch on that a little bit more, but what David is going to be describing is what we would describe as like the historic Orthodox view of, of what hell as part of the afterlife looks like. Yes. And so, in fact, I, I wrote down a definition that was as plain Jane (laughs) as you can possibly get. Like the definition I have written down is the generic doctrine as the belief that it is logical and, well, let me skip that, uh, that a person's will experience an everlasting existence, each of whose moments is on the whole bad. Okay? So <laughs> I, 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 I thought this was as simple of a definition as we could use. Because um, as Kevin said, and I, and I think it's, it's worth kind of diving into it, and, and maybe when Kevin goes into it, like that might pique your interest, and this might be a topic that you... There are in. some that actually... And, and I, I don't, it, it's debated amongst Christian circles whether some of these various views of the afterlife are what would be deemed as heretical or not. Um, but there are, there are even annihilationists out there mm-hmm. that actually right. don't believe that those that don't spend eternity with God spend eternity in hell, that they might spend some time there, but at the right. final judgment, they get thrown into what the book of Revelation would call the lake of fire, and that they term that as like a, as the final descent <laughs> yeah for for their existence metaphysically speaking so it, it it it's common for those of us especially if you grew up in the united states to have this very um specific view of hell it's dark but also f- on fire and hot all the time and that you just sent there and you're just literally on fire uh 24 7 um and for eternity and there are some that that hold to that um and we'll get into why that is here. At I mean, we so could do a, a whole minute, episode on, but just, have just hell, know honestly. that the, the actual doctrine of hell is, is debated on some levels mm-hmm. on, even mm-hmm. if it's eternal itself. Right. Yeah. And so when I use the word hell, that is all I am referencing to right now, right? It's just everlasting existence, which is on the whole bad. <laughs> um, and so, People will look at that and say, well, that's just, you know, it's unfair, it's harsh, it's it's too long. So I'm going to just present kind of the basic arguments that Christians um, have presented throughout history. Uh, so Augustine uh, basically makes the argument that there that, that that is no problem. We actually give out punishments that exceed the crime's length all the time. So the example he gives, you know, it could take you 10 minutes to kill somebody. It could tell you it could take you 10 minutes to rob somebody and you could spend a much longer period in prison or the rest of your life in prison for that that 10 minutes of right. of a crime. So he says lo- logically this is actually not a very good or strong argument. And Aquinas actually takes that and runs with it and says, well, if you're going to have problems with eternal punishment being unjust, then you probably also need to have problems with eternal bliss or heaven because it is also an unjust response to finite goodness of mankind. Um, And again, that's, he's not trying to make that as his argument. He's just saying we have to be, if we're going to make that argument, you have to be logically consistent with both. Um, um, Anselm actually argues that the seriousness of the punishment um, is because of who the sin is committed against, right? And so in 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 the future, right, because Anselm and, Ed, and Jonathan Edwards didn't get to talk to each other, but, but <laughs> Edwards kind of like pulls from that and says, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. 
we are we are not just sinning against one another, but ultimately we're sinning against God, who is infinitely great, infinitely worthy of worship, and therefore a transgression against him warrants infinite consequences. Yeah. Um, and so again, just just by the way, we hold to this. Yeah. Right. Because if like just a common example, right? If I lie to my kids, there will be some consequences to that. Right. If I lie to my wife, there will be greater consequences <laughs> for that. Yes. Right. If I lie and commit treason against the American government, death sentence. Like we hold, we we actually hold to these types of things and like live out the reality of them all the time. Edwards and Anselm's point is, if that's the way we're going to approach, right, the crime of lying or treason, right, betrayal, right, for one's um, loyalty to their own country, how much more so than to the loyalty and um, betrayal to the God and Creator of all things? Yeah, yeah. and so the. My initial pushback would be that at least rationally, the case can be made that it is not too harsh. Or right? unjust. Or unjust at all. And I would even, to, to use kind of the language of the third iteration of the question, it, it's actually not even unloving. It, because because we, we tend to want to pit justice and love against each other when in reality they're in perfect harmony. Um, but... What I don't want to, what I don't want this to come off as is, oh, we have a good answer to the question that oh hell must be unjust, so in your face, and we're very happy about it or whatever. Like yeah. it we're is like really glad that people are gonna die and spend eternity in hell. <laughs> no, yeah. like that is that is not yeah. the message we're trying to mm -hmm. push forward here. Or and I would say it's not the message the Bible's trying to push. No. Right. Right. In in Ezekiel 33, 11, for example, it says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Mm -hmm. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And this is obviously referring to to his people, but it is so clear that God does does not want people to perish. I mean, if if you actually believe that, then it would make zero sense for God to take on flesh and die on the cross. Like it, it would make the the New Testament would make zero sense if if God just wanted people to for the wicked to perish and for just everybody to to not repent. He could very well have had his way long long before. Um, but so what I what I am trying to clearly depict is the reason we we don't think and we we don't think it's it's a good position to say like oh well well hell is just too harsh or it's unjust is because one it is god who is being offended and he's being offended by un the, those who end up in hell are unrepentant sinners right like the gospel message is very clear any who turn to christ believe in him will have eternal life right their, their sins are forgiven. Uh, that is, we, we strongly believe that, that the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is not just sufficient, but is all that, it, it's not just sufficient, but it, it's available to all who are willing to turn from their sins, repent, and believe in him. And so it is for, for unrepentant sinners who end up in hell. And this is why, you know, C.S. Lewis takes the, the position that he says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without the self-conscious, there could be no hell. No soul that could seriously and constantly desire joy will ever miss it. Those who seek it, those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is open. And it's this realization like anyone who rejects God and you know receives the the punishment from their sin we cannot make the argument that that is unjust or too harsh now i think as christians we have to live in this tension 
of, yes, we hold to that and we strongly believe that. And two, we should be sorrowful that so many will end up there and without knowledge of Jesus and without, and that should just like move our, not just physical hearts, but our spiritual hearts towards evangelism, towards sharing the good news, because we, we don't want that for people. Like, like it's, it, 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 this discussion, th- these questions should not lead us to, li- to live like stagnant spiritual lives, which should lead us to want to like share the good news with as many people as will hear us. Um, and so I hope that that's the tension you're getting with these responses. No, that rationally I can make a good argument against that question, but at the same time, like I want to be on par with the heart of God, which the, which which takes no pleasure in the death in the death of the wicked. Yeah, death of the wicked. Yeah. So David's kind of presented to us um, some reasons as to why hell in and of itself or the idea of of punishment for sin post death uh, is not an unreasonable position to hold uh, intellectually and 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 why it's not wrong or evil of God to do such a thing. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more maybe about like the 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 common maybe misconception. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's the right word, but just maybe the the common beliefs on on what people think hell is and how that may or may not deviate away from what the Bible says. Because oftentimes I think when when people ask me this question, they have a very specific idea of what hell is. And um it, it's always hard for me to engage them in that in in that question because hell may very well be like what they're presenting to us from like an illustrative position, but it might not be. And I like I remember um when I first moved to Gainesville and we were starting the church and we, I, I was with this coworker and she was describing to me her, her issues with, with, with hell. And one of the things she's like, so you just believe that, that people just burn up for eternity. Like they just sit there and they're on fire for eternity. And my response to her was, um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. She's like, well, like, do you think it's like, do you think it's like bad or is it like better? I was like, it's like, I, I don't know. I think it has the potential to be far worse even than something like that. And I don't know if my mind can comprehend that, but I think that's what the scripture is getting at more so than, hey, hell's a literal place that you're just, on, that it's just on fire all the time and you're on fire. Because um, hell may or may not be what we tend to preconceive when we are talking about it. When Jesus speaks on hell, the term he he uses regularly is Gehenna. Um and it, it's it's not only his word, but it, it for hell, but it is his most frequently used one for hell. And Gehenna was a real place in Jesus's day. It was south of Jerusalem. Now there there are some that believe that it was basically the city dump and that it was on fire all the time. Um, there's lots of debate on whether that's actually the 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 case or not. But it's reasonable to believe that it was possible because a, a, a city that large would need a place to get rid of refuse. But if not. Um, if that's not the case, um, it was historically definitely the place that was one of the darkest, um, one of the darkest places geographically for Israel from a historical perspective. The, Gehenna was the region south of Jerusalem where when Israel was at the height of their idolatry and uh, rejection of God and uh, participating in pagan practices that had been introduced into the region where all sorts of wicked and evil things happened amongst God's people, including even human and child sacrifice. And so whether he's referring to the dump that was on fire all the time, which is the position of some scholars and theologians, or whether Jesus is just simply referencing, hey, you guys know all about Gehenna. You know the historical, uh, geographical uh, realities that that area holds for our people, that they hold some of Israel's darkest moments. It was literally hell on earth for some people. Jesus is communicating for those that leave this life not 
in Christ, unrepentant. You want to know what it's going to look like for you? What separation from me and the Father is going to look like? It's going to look like that place with its wickedness, with its idolatry, with the horrors that are committed there. That's what's going to be like. You know, commonly, the reason why Christians have held to this idea of it being on fire all the time is because of Jesus' story that he shares about Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16. Let me, let me just read that story to you because I actually think it'll help give some context. Um, so Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19, says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. So we see there a teaching by Jesus that this man's soul was carried to God's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So at this point, we have at least a basic teaching about Jesus is that there's two places to go to. One referred to as Hades, which would have been a, a term actually from Greek um, mythology. Uh, but it's the idea of the underworld, where the dead go. And in Hades, he's in torment. He lifts up his eyes. He sees Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, And he calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. So that is where, by the way, you get the idea that he's burning constantly is he wants water on his tongue to cool the, fl- to the flame. Now, what's interesting about that um, is if you were on fire, I highly doubt that your tongue would be like the first thing you want to be put out. But Indeed. you know, maybe maybe I'm crazy. I, I think again, we're we're talking more so about imagery here and the torment that he's going through. Okay. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, talking about Lazarus, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So he's basically like, well, like go save my brothers then, please. Like I don't want them to come here. Like We want them to believe in you. Please send Lazarus back to talk to my, my brothers. They'll recognize the dead guy coming to talk to him. And Abraham says, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, because if someone goes to them, the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, Mm -hmm. if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And that is that last little line there is something kind of important that Jesus is pointing out. But But what I want us to understand is Jesus is teaching here on hell and the afterlife is there's a chasm. Lazarus, who was once in anguish, is no longer in in anguish. The rich man is in anguish. But while he's in hell, and I think this is an interesting note about Jesus' story. He doesn't mention it in the story, but David mentioned earlier the idea that those that go to hell are unrepentant sinners. And Abraham seems to point out to the rich man in this story, you did not love or serve others, including Lazarus, in your previous life. As a matter of fact, you only were served by others. What is the posture of the rich man in Luke 16, even when he's in hell? That he should still be served. He should still be served by Lazarus. Hmm. Why? Because even in the afterlife, he's still unrepentant of what he believes reality should be. So to for full disclosure... Even as a pastor who's studied theology and been through seminary and and read through the Bible multiple times, I'm actually unsure about some of the specifics regarding hell. Yeah. Whether there's actually fire there, what the torment looks like, etc. Here's what I do know for sure. The Bible teaches that hell is a real place. It is a place where unrepentant sinners who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ go. And it is terrible. Mainly, 
and this is my philosophical belief, because human beings are fully given over to their wickedness there, and God provides no comfort from that. It's where you would imagine human beings completely unrestrained by any sense of morality or goodness. Mm. And to think of that, to be quite honest, petrifies me. Because the scripture at least teaches here that there is some level of restraint that exists even when we see wickedness and suffering in this life. And so the reality is, is hell may very well be a place where there's fire all around you all the time. I, I don't know. The reality of what Scripture does teach, though, is whatever it exact, exactly it is and what it looks like, it is horrible. And you need to take seriously the reality, both for yourself and consider your own place before God, but also take very seriously the place of others in your life before God as well. Because it, just because you are a disciple of Christ, and so that's not a reality for you, I can guarantee you someone listening to this knows somebody right now where that is not the reality for them, and this is what awaits them. And We don't share this as a fear tactic, but as a somber warning for the reality of what life will look like after this one. Yeah, no, so as, and I think that brings us into the the last question I'll ask in relation to this that we'll wrap up real quickly you know, as we've been wrestling with an afterlife life, as we've been wrestling with the specific idea of what hell is, um, why do we think people might be asking this question? You know, and are there even potential questions behind the questions? And I know David kind of hit on this when he uh, maybe threw out some other near questions. Um, but what do you guys think in that regard? I'll have like two quick categories for these i think the first one and the one that i hear the most often from christians is what kevin just highlighted right like the realization of i just don't want this to be true for so many people that i care about and i'll be a hundred percent honest i don't either like this is not something that i take like pleasure in like being like this just it's just true right it's not something that i'm like happy or excited that that punishment has to happen or that there will be those who do not repent who not turn to who don't turn to jesus like it would be easier for me if this was not the case right and so i feel like that is maybe a reason that a lot of these questions and objections would arise because someone just wants us so badly to not be the case um and then so that's that's like within Within, Christ, within a Christian worldview. And then I think from from the skeptic position, and I think we hopefully highlighted some of that with our responses and, and, and our answers today, is I think it can be very easy for someone to just think sin's not that big of a deal um, or that we as human beings aren't quite that bad. Um, and, and, and ultimately all that just kind of comes from a, a poor understanding of like who God is and his holiness and just how perfect and righteous he is. Um, and so I think fueled from that, those might be actually the questions that need to be answered. It's like, Oh, like, well, no, we are like, this is why sin is such a, a big problem. Oh, I, I thought sin was just like, Oh, when someone says a little white lie and they, they led me astray, or what, what, whatever the, Oh, they just broke some rule that someone set. Like, like those might be the questions behind this this question. Um, or like, why why does why is that even important to God? Like, why does He care about things that are good? Like, yeah. those might be the questions that actually lead to the answer that that skeptic or that individual needs. Um, but I, I would say like. The first one's just the mo- most common one. It's just yeah. hard. I, I wanted to say something to that too, David, because I, I've heard that a lot from people too. I, I I just can't accept that, you know, a loving God would let something so horrible exist or whatever else. And I, I think like th- there's actually like a um, intellectual fallacy being committed there. You know, I can, I can as a Christian hate 
the fact that hell is a reality, but still accept it and teach it because it's what the scripture teaches and um, have a worldview that causes me to live my life in such a way that tries to encourage other people to not go there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and here, and here's how I kind of like compare it. Um, I can hate cancer and the existence of cancer. Um, but if, if I hate it, it doesn't make it go away. Right. I, I can hate a lot of things that are uncomfortable or create suffering or create uh, strife or hardship for people. Um, can even, but refusing to accept and acknowledge their existence doesn't do anything. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say is um, it contributes to the darkness and the evil of it. Right? One of the beautiful things I think that I, I appreciate about human beings is the collective work that many human beings are doing to tackle questions like cancer. I would argue that it's part of God's promise to us and part of his common grace towards us, but that's a different podcast for a different time. But uh, disliking the reality of something uh, doesn't mean that it might not be true. And refusing to accept that it is true um, won't make it less so if it is. And so that would be kind of like my first response to, to just that. Of and, and I know your bigger question, Isaiah, is why why would someone ask this question? I think sure. David did a great job of answering that. I, I would just add, um, the doctrine of hell is admittedly difficult. Yeah. No matter where you land on it. I mean, even if you're an annihilationist, still admittedly difficult in my opinion um and i think the reason for that is we as human beings actually really love justice but not when we don't get to define it and it seems unjust because we are not the one being sinned against and rebel against when we as human beings sin ultimately right it's against our god the other thing that makes this difficult is we also lack the ability to fully comprehend the magnitude of our wickedness apart from the revelation of God, mm-hmm. as we saw earlier in that passage in Ecclesiastes. And so maybe my encouragement to those that are listening is Christianity, in my opinion, is not a part of the choose-your-own-adventure smorgasbord of worldviews. It's either wholly true or it's not. Either Jesus Christ really did come, live, and die, and rose again the third day, and is now alive, ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father as is taught in Christianity, and with that, the things that Jesus taught, including what the afterlife looks like, which would include hell, is real, and a real reality that the human race faces, or it's not. Your feelings don't dictate whether that's a reality or not. Now, uh, hear me, right? Because I know some of you are hearing it and you're going to think, oh, this guy's really rude. He doesn't care how hard this is for me. Look, if you think you're wrestling with this, trust me, I've wrestled with it and I'm likely older than you, so I've just wrestled with it longer, right? We get, we get no excitement about this being true or being a reality, but our feelings don't dictate whether it's true or not. Right. It either is or it is not. And so our encouragement to you would be seek some of the evidence that we talked about if you're a skeptic. Consider what the scripture teaches. Because if you're wrong about this, it's a very serious thing to be wrong about. Yeah, and and I think this topic even presses those of us who do believe it and who are believers to really reflect and see the seriousness of what scripture shows us that hell is and and really can encourage us to be more open about our faith in love towards those around us um so thank you guys for having arguably another tough discussion, but I think a very valuable one and a very important one. And if you're listening, thank you for joining us and sticking around for the whole thing. Um, 
As before, if you have any questions or any ideas, please email us at podcast at alethegainesville.com. And uh, if this episode was insightful to you or encouraging or challenging, uh, we encourage you to share it. Uh, like, subscribe, do the things that people do. And uh, we appreciate you guys consistently listening. listening. So uh, with that, we encourage you all to go and be the church. I can't see myself, but I can see both. Why, why are there things above me? Those are little indicators like record light. They're, they're things on... The they're screen. Not they're there. not in the shot. They're on the screen. They're like indicators for like video people. They show like color temperature. I don't need to know all this. It's just something that's for the camera. That's it's all not you need actually to say. there. That's all right. he needs. That's to all, say. I, I was looking back here and there's nothing on the wall and I'm like, what's going on here? That, the first dude, time. Dude, I'm not a boomer. I just was wondering what it was. We don't like. I don't know what any of that means. So just you know, dumb it down to stupid level. I and was let's move trying. On.